How are you guys doing? Wait, okay. I'm Linda. I was on stage a couple minutes ago, and I'm here to talk to you about Tor. I work at Tor, and the goal of my presentation for just this casual talk is to tell you what Tor is, what Tor aims to do, and maybe how you can get involved. But before I start, does anyone here have any exposure to Tor? Has anyone heard of it? Has anyone used it? Cool. Are those positive things or negative things? Let's be real. Oh, what's the positive thing you heard about Tor? I'll repeat it over the mic so other people can hear. Anonymity, cool. Yeah, there's some bad stuff about Tor too. All the bad stuff is close. But first, a message from our sponsor. Actually, there's a video that Tor Project made that I think is how they want to project what they are doing to the mass public. And I have some caveats with that, but I think it's important to show you. So without any further ado, here we go. If I can get it to work. Also, I didn't figure out how the sound works, so I'm just going to do one of these to the, to the computer. Wasn't that exciting? So <laughs> I would I would like to add something to this. I think this is a very reactionary video because the general story I think you've heard before is that it's where the dark web lives. There's bad people on it and bad things happen. And I have to say that personally, that makes me very sad. I don't think that certain things should be on the internet, especially things related to young kids. Um, I don't think it's that bad to buy drugs online, but I don't think that we should support any illegal activity. And because of all this negative press, I think this is the reaction. And I think that the story of, hey, we're here just to make all the bad guys' lives easier, that's not really true. And I think that there are corporations, there are governments that are targeting their users. But ta -da, Tor's here to save the day and we're the heroes. I don't think that's quite true either. I think that something that I believe is important to note that if the government really wanted to be anonymous, they create their own identities or they just don't go after themselves. The bad guys can go back to stealing identities, which is a bit harder, so we're making their life easier. But the regular person really has no way to stay anonymous. And I think 
it's bad that we're helping everyone at once, but we're trying to fight for the average person. And I don't like this idea of tour fixing all of your problems because it is the best thing to do some of the things that it mentioned, like the convincing to share, not get tracked online. But I think the story that I want to tell is, is that the internet wasn't built with security in mind. It's not doing anything that it's not supposed to do. You're sending information where people can alter it, people can look at it, people can intercept it, and that's just how it's built. Tor's trying to build something different so that it has a security properties that I think people who don't know much about the internet would expect from the internet. So if I try to send you something, I would expect for my message to get there, get there to you, and for you to receive what I sent. But that's not necessarily the case. And I think that designing something specifically for security properties is important. And I don't think that calling every one of you in this room a victim, a powerless person to all these corporations is actually a good tactic either. I think that everyone makes their own choices. I use Facebook because it's fun and that's a good enough reason for me. But if you want to take the information that you have into your own hands and to use something more secure for certain purposes, I think that this is one of the tools that turns you from, I guess, the victim to the hero and towards just a tool. We're not necessarily the bad guys, we're not necessarily the good guys. And I think that's a more accurate way of representing things. Uh, but since I am hired by Tor, I have to say that Tor allows for free speech, access to information, privacy, and security. And this is just because of the resulting security properties that it provides. So the fact that encryption happens to provide some security properties, like the inability for other people to read what you say. So in that way, we fight for free speech. And because Tor acts as a proxy, it allows you to circumvent stuff. And these are happy accidents, and we think that these are good accidents. And as a corporation, we do have a firm stance on fighting for digital human rights online. So I would like to talk about two things or two ways that Tor helps support a more secure internet. The first way it does this is that it provides a network, the Tor network, for applications to run on securely and anonymously. It is kind of a misconception that the only thing Tor does is make Tor browser, but the Tor network supports applications that are not specific to Tor, and you yourself can develop an application and make it compatible to run over Tor. There are cryptocurrency applications, file sharing applications, and chat applications that are not developed by Tor content that still use the Tor network to get the same type of guarantees like location anonymity that Tor browser provides. And we encourage people to route their traffic over Tor not only because it's secure for the users, but it provides more traffic on the network so everyone's a little bit more anonymous. The second way that we help in this fight for digital human rights is that we make it we make a browser and it is the most popular application run on the Tor network. It's an open source browser, so you don't have to trust us. Branch from Firefox, another open source browser that allows you to browse the web and send traffic through the Tor network. Since you are a more technical audience, I think it'd be fun to go into what the Tor network is actually about. So I think that there are many anonymity systems out there and Tor is not the only one. I personally think that in some ways anonymity systems are a solved problem. So let's say I wanted to send a message to you and I wanted it to be anonymous for the people in this room. We could have a system that sends a message once a month, waits for about n number, that could be a very big number, thousand messages, and everyone sends the same message to everyone else. Every message is padded. And only it's up to you to discard the messages that are encrypted to you. That's just bad because there's too much bandwidth used. It takes a lot of time and it's not very efficient. So Tor aims to be a low latency, decentralized internet overlay network. And what that means is that we don't use time delays to try to add to your anonymity. So one way that I could try to hide myself from sending a message is to 
wait a really long time until a lot of people are ready to send their messages and send them all at once, or I could just add five or ten seconds to whenever I send the message to make it look like different from, I guess, predictive behavioral patterns or exact traces. We think that this is important just because you want to use the internet and you don't want to wait so long for you to get everything. It's also decentralized, which means you don't have to trust any key servers or any one of the servers, really. I think to take over your traffic or trace your traffic back to you, an adversary would need to post so many of their own nodes that even through our vetting and reputation process, they compromise all of the paths in the way, which is very difficult to do. And it is an overlay network. Oh, I have all cute icons for these. Okay, that one. That one's the overlay icon, that's the decentralized icon, that's the not adding any time to waste icon. Anyway, it's an overlay network, which means that it allows interoperability with the internet. I don't know if anyone here has heard of I2P, but it is an intranet that allows you to send traffic over its network, but only to other nodes of the network. So it's kind of like another internet that lives on its own. And I think that's pretty cool, but I think it's also important to have something that works with the internet and is a little bit more secure than the internet. Tor Browser is a browser that does three key things. It provides location anonymity, I'm remembering this time, fingerprint resistance, and anti-tracking. And I think it's important to know that the network itself gives you many valuable security properties, but you need to take additional precautions to secure yourself when you're on the internet. Which is why we really encourage people to use Tor Browser instead of other browsers over Tor. For instance, I think that if you route your traffic over Tor, but don't have any defenses against fingerprinting, someone can identify you from a sea of other people, or other browser instances rather, by the combination of bookmarks you have, the combination of extensions, what screen size you have, how you render your images, what gets pulled from your operating system and all those things like that. So I think that it is very important to be aware that there are other ways that you could be de-anonymized rather than just your IP address and location and to defend against all of that to remain truly anonymous. We also have anti-tracking features. So even if you are pseudo-anonymous, let's say they can't quite tell who you are, but you could be one of 10 people, they could still follow you around. And we try to refresh our circuits every 10 minutes so that you actually look like you're a different person and that your traffic comes from a different place every 10 minutes. I think that this is important for just everyday use, but it comes with a couple perks. I think that anyone here who has used Tor Browser has probably been mad at Tor Browser at one point. I've been pretty mad at it. When I first used it, I actually thought, hmm, why is Tor slow, French, and dumb? It's slow because of the added latency. It's French because it pops you out at a random exit node, and it might not be in your country. And I popped out in France, and everything I found was in French. And it seemed like it wasn't doing exactly what it was supposed to do because it blocked all of my scripts, and images won't load, and things like that. But these are actually defenses that are built in on purpose. I actually don't know if it's actually great in terms of the experience that it gives our users on the user experience lead, and I actually think it's pretty terrible. I think it's pretty necessary, and we don't want to undermine our security guarantees, though. Does anyone have any questions before I move on to how we work at Tor? It does have a user agent. I think it tries to spoof the same user agent for every single instance of Tor Browser. And we do other things like, I don't know, make sure we ship it with a standard set of fonts and not call for any fonts with the operating system and things like that. Can you expand a bit on that fingerprinting part? How exactly does it work? He asked if I could expand on the fingerprinting part and how does it work? Oh boy. So what do you want to know about it? Do you want to know how often it happens, who does it, why it happens, how it happens? How it happens. I think there are whole papers dedicated to researching how it happens, but I could just give you a couple examples, and I hope that helps. 
So I think that one way to fingerprint you is on the exact dimensions of your screen and how your screen is aliasing. So when you usually open up a browser, it maximizes to your screen size. And that's highly specific to your operating system, when you bought your computer and all these other things. So just by your screen size, they can't exactly tell who you are from millions and millions of people, but they can narrow you down to the pool of users using that specific operating system or that, from that specific year and all that kind of stuff. Another way to fingerprint you is to see how you read your font. So let's say you visit a website and they ask you to display the letter A. And usually if there is no font provided, the browser will pick the default one for your operating system. So which one that chooses, how big it's rendered, how it's rendered, how it's alias, and even just by looking at the size, you can actually differentiate a lot of people. My colleague actually wrote a paper on this, and it's about 20 pages long, and I'm not doing it justice, but it's actually quite crazy. I think if you test high variance characters like groupies and try to render them in different colors and different, I don't know, bold italicized and whatnot, you can actually identify users pretty easily. David Fikeu. All right, since this is a developer conference, I think that we're always looking for talented people to collaborate with, but I think also you might be actually interested in how we work. I think it put a lot of people to sleep, but I feel like, oh boy, I can talk about this. So here I am. I think you'd be interested to know that we are almost 100% remote, except for our operations team, so payroll as a desk next to our finances person. But other than that, we are developers all around the world. All of our work is open source. And you'd be surprised to know that we only have about 30 something full-time hired employees and hundreds of volunteers. So we actually really depend on the community, I think. If you ask us to do it ourselves versus cut off everyone in the community, I think the right thing to be fire ourselves. It's actually amazing how much people contribute, and we really encourage you to get involved. If you see something bad, you can file a ticket, or you can just complain with us, or you can write code for us if you really want to. So I think that I would, we have six teams at Tor, and three teams mainly support the network, and three teams mainly support the browser. So the three teams that support the network are the network team, the metrics team, and Boney team, or is it the Boney team? I don't know how they refer to themselves. The network team supports the Tor network protocol and other network elements such as relays, transports, and bridges. And if you don't know what that means, if you talk to them, they'll tell you for about an hour. If you like cryptography, routing, load balancing, infrastructure work, which I'm glad someone does, this team is for you. And this is our biggest team. And it's quite exciting, you'd be surprised at the kind of complexities that we deal with. And you also get to do fun stuff like trying to find your adversarial nodes, which you don't get to do anywhere else. The metrics team measures the health and status of the Tor network. It securely and safely only uses approximations for the number of relays, users, and the bandwidth. And we try to keep an eye on if we need to add more relays, where the spikes are, and things like that. And the UNI team, which stands for Open Observatory Network Interference, measures the browser. There's the Applications team, the User Experience team, and the Onion team, which sounds a little weird. But the Applications team does more than develop Tor browser, but this is the main application that they develop. They also develop Tor browser for mobile, Tor Messenger, and other applications you may have heard of. We are currently aggressively trying to get mobile versions of Tor Browser to be on par with our desktop counterpart. It currently doesn't have all of the features and all of the security defenses. And we're actually hiring. So if you want to, if you know how to code and you're really excited about making Android apps, you should probably look at the Tor job subscription. We are currently not officially supporting any mobile browsers. 
we work with a partner organization that developed a browser which we recommend for Android and another partner to develop something that has more like properties for iOS, but neither of them provide the same security guarantees as Tor browsers, so we don't just call them Tor browser everywhere because I think that'd be a little deceiving. But the goal is in the next year to release an official Tor browser on Android. And when we get the funding, we should probably hire someone for iOS. And we think we should insist that we're not currently. The user experience team, me, worked with the application team to design user interfaces, graphical elements, brainstorming features through user testing and validate changes. So something that we did recently was that we found out that there were six different six different menus that you can adjust your security settings in Tor Browser, and that's a lot, and they have interdependencies, so in which order you choose them kind of affects what happens, and we think this is bad, so we're trying to make it not bad, so that's the kind of stuff we do. And the Onion team supports Onion Services, which is a way for you to publish things anonymously. It's kind of a counterpart to Tor Browser. Tor Browser allows you to go to services anonymously, and Onion Services, which are technically what make up the dark web, are a way for others, or is a way for you to publish anonymously. And they work on protocol adjustments, server user authentication, load balancing, all that kind of stuff. And a fun fact, I think I mentioned this fun fact in the main room before, but I would like to point out that the most used onion service is Facebook and accounts for a huge portion of the quote unquote dark net traffic. So is that actually what you think it is? In conclusion, the Tor network is a low latency decentralized overnight network that provides the security that we need. I hope that you understand a little bit more about different anonymity systems and how Tor fits into that ecosystem. The Tor browser provides surveillance resistance, censorship protection, privacy, and security, and we think that these are good things. And we and I hope that you think that these are good things too. And we explicitly support human rights and we want you to join us in that effort. I think that was the name of my talk. It was something really bold, cool, like join the fight for censorship resistance, which I think it should, but I think I just wanted to alert people there. And if you want to get involved, there are a bunch of different ways that you can get involved. The first and most easy thing that you can do is just to download the browser and use it. And I'm not just saying that because we make money, because we're a nonprofit, we get no money. Uh, it's unique in the sense that when you use Tor Browser, you are another person in the network and you literally increase the anonymity set and literally make it safer for everyone else. And while it is a bit of a pain to you, if you think that it is useful for something, we encourage you to use it. Another thing you can do for us is to run a relay in the network now, I think that other people in the organization would encourage you to run a relay. It's really great to be a part of this network, but I actually don't like doing that because some people have been arrested for running relays. Some people don't know how Tor works, and police think that just because you're running one, you're participating in gangs that distribute really bad things. So I actually personally do not advocate that you run a relay without doing much expensive research and take a lot of political heat on a very safe country. And if you of course do, choose to do so, we like being able to send you a t-shirt, but <laughs> you can also volunteer your time, poke around online. If any of the six teams interested you, you can contact them. You can just browse through the tickets if you see one that you think you can resolve. By all means, I think we're supposed to have an easy to do ticket section, which none of them are really easy to do, but the other ones are even harder to do. And if you really, really, really like the idea of Tor, we are hiring. There are two spots open for Android developers to make a mobile version of Tor Browser. So if you're interested in something like that, here's a little plus for that. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the time. I would like to take any additional time to see if anyone has any questions. I don't know how we're doing on time. I don't know when you need to go, you're up next, but maybe I can for a couple minutes. So 
uh, emission of air somewhere like cobalt and some uh, uh, minus equals using cobalt with it. Could you please summarize, comparing to using Chrome or your conventional browsers, how does the experience compare and what are the missing features that we used to have in casual browsers? So the question for everyone who couldn't hear was that I mentioned trade-offs for using Tor Browser. And how does the experience compare between using Tor Browser and using another browser like Chrome? And I would say that, although I don't like to say this, using Tor is kind of a drain. I don't think it's, from a user standpoint, that much more enjoyable to use it in any way, shape, or form. I think maybe you feel really cool for using it. Maybe you feel happy that you're getting the additional security guarantee, but it's slower because it has additional hops onto the network and it encrypts your message three times. It kind of makes it blow up exponentially and all that stuff. We disable all these cool things like making videos play automatically, interactive features. So everything looks a little like it's from the early 2000s and it's a little slow. Like I said, I felt like it was first slow, first and done. But that being said, I think it's the security guarantees that really are the selling point. And I think that it's unfortunate that a lot of the people that use Tor are highly technical enough to understand those security guarantees and what that means to them and are also, I guess, private enough or they care enough about their personal data to actually use it. But we just want to make it easier to use. Where does the name come from, like Tor? That's a great question. So the Tor browser is actually an acronym. And it was first designed as a research project. It was capital T-O-R. It stands for the onion router. And onion routing is the technical cute term for things that encrypt your message in layers. Another fun fact, if you use capital T-O-R to refer to Tor, people think that you don't actually know what Tor is and that you just read the research paper. If you use capital T, lowercase O-R, you're actually talking about anything, the Tor network, Tor the identity, Tor browser. If you, move, if you use lowercase T-O-R, you're actually talking about the network protocol. We call it little T Tor inside Tor. So if you want to impress your friends and look like an insider, there you go. All right, any more questions? Okay, one last one. Yeah, um, I have a political question. You mentioned earlier about the darknet, and I was wondering um, how do you justify for providing anonymity versus like the space for darknet? The question was, how do you support supporting anonymity when it allows for some of the dark activities to occur on the internet? I think that it's really unfortunate that those things happen. I actually personally haven't really worked out how much that is okay or at what point. Like, if 100% of our users are bad guys, then of course, that would probably be not okay. Let's say there were 50%, is it okay then? If the other 50% were journalists that would have gotten in big trouble or killed if they weren't otherwise using Tor? I don't know. If it's 1% or a very small percentage, it's estimated that it's actually a very small minority, but still, is it okay to make any illegal activity easier? I think that's a philosophical question that I haven't worked out, but I think the official answer from Tor is that you know, we provide anonymity, it's what people do with it. We do not support these illegal actions. And if we do our work to de-anonymize those who do it for bad, who use it for bad purposes, it'll break users' trust. And we can easily do that for everyone else. And we actually don't have the capability to de-anonymize people. And we have that built in. So I think that it is just, the dark side of things, things can be used for good and bad. That's a really unsatisfying answer on this side. All right, thank you so much for your time.